I love to praise Give the most 
the more earnest, the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the words spoken by angels were was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if, if we neglect so great salvation? which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed then unto us by them that heard him. God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and with divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. It's not time to let down. But if you have God's mercy, is still available. It's not time to let down, but if, if you have, God's mercy is still available. God bless you. You can be seated. It was a long time ago, back in the 80s, July 20th, 1981, and David Kirkwin and Ronald Ratliff arrived at Yellowstone Park, and they went there, obviously, for a vacation. And they made their first stop. And once the car stopped, David's dog jumped out of the car. And believe it or not, he jumped right into a hot spring and began to yelp. Now, now David exited the car because he saw his dog jump in the spring and he loved his dog. And so he began to prepare, to, to prepare himself to jump in after the dog. And people began to scream, hey, don't, don't do that. Don't, don't do that. Now, we all know that the boiling water temperature is, what, 212 degrees? Is that right? 212. And many of the springs there in Yellowstone are just below that temperature or way above that temperature. And, and so if you jump in to one of those hot springs, you're going to feel immense pain. And it will be one of the most intense burns you'll probably ever experience in your life. But still... David's dog was in the hot spring yelping. And so David paid no attention to anyone saying, don't, don't do that. Don't jump in after him. And he did. And he jumped in there to save his dog. And unfortunately, the dog did not make it out alive. And David did, but he ended up with third degree burns on 100% of his body. And, and when it was all said and done, he could, he could still talk. But he lost his eyesight. And he would later say to someone laying in the hospital room, I did a stupid, stupid thing, didn't I? And it was obvious, it was obvious to those people around what, was, what he was fixing to do, how, 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 how not very smart that was. But he apparently wasn't thinking or he wasn't listening or he just simply refused the warning and he jumped in. We, you and I, would be wise to consider the warnings of others. Because often in the heat of the moment, in the emotion of the moment, we don't see the danger. We don't see the possible outcome. And so God has put people around us. It says, hey, 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 before you jump in there, before you do that, would you just stop and think about it? Would you pray about that? Would you wait a minute? Including God has put somebody every Sunday and every Sunday night and every Wednesday that stands behind this pulpit as well. And, and I personally would never do anything at all to hurt anyone on purpose. That's why today, like the people at Yellowstone, I must sound a warning to you today. And you may think, I don't need to hear that. But you know what? I need to hear this. We all do from time to time. And that is because of the time in which we live, it's not time to let down, nor is it ever, or turn back, or give in, or let something slip, no matter what. And again, especially in the world in which we live right now, this morning I saw Putin. Putin has, has said, hey, let's get our nuclear weapons ready just in case. Now, now again, that's Putin, I understand that, but still, things aren't going quite like he maybe probably hope for and so there, there's a resistance there there's people taking up arms and, and, and NATO and different ones are kind of saying what have you done 
And so it isn't going quite like he wants it to. And so he today, this morning, said, hey, let's get our nuclear weapons ready just in case. So, again, not trying to scare anybody. Just saying, hey, now's the time to get ready and stay ready. It's not time to play around in the house of God. It's time to, time to get ready. It's time to get ready because Jesus is coming back after his church. He's coming back after his church and I want to be ready. Right? How about you? I want to be ready to leave this world. Amen. Whether I go by the way of the grave or I go in the rapture, I want to be ready. I want to be ready. And, and, and possibly you've been in the church for a long, long time and, and uh, you experienced being born again of water and of spirit a long time ago. And you've been walking with Jesus a long, long time. Still, no matter how old you are or how young you are or how long you've been living for God or how long you have not been living for God, listen, we're going to all struggle with the flesh. As long as there's breath in your body, we're going to all struggle with this flesh. And even if you have been living for God for years, still, you're going to struggle as well, just like younger people struggle. Now, now your sin that you struggle with or the things you struggle with may not be the same as someone that's younger than you, but still, it may not be the same sin, but everyone is going to still struggle in all areas, in certain areas in particular. Maybe not all areas, but in, in certain areas. And it depends on you, your personality, and your weak areas, and I think we all got soft spots, right? Yeah. And we all have to be, we have to guard those soft spots. I'm talking about even Holy Ghost field individuals. We, we got things that, hey, we know that, that, ooh, if we were, we could get easily drawn into that. And so, so, so we are not, uh, we're not unwise, but we realize that when that calls us or knocks on our door, we have to resist that. Yes. Can somebody say Amen. Again, because of your age and because of your experience and the battles that you've already fought and the storms you have already lived through and the tests you have already passed, it may feel like to you today, I've been through so much already, I've already fought the battle, and now I just want to kind of finish the race by just kind of sitting here on the sidelines and just wait till my time comes. I was talking to Brother Byron this morning. We were talking about his dad and his mom and their situations. And you know what? You would think once you reach a particular age or you have lived for so long for God that, that you would just kind of get a, a pass. You know, that you just kind of, you know, after you reach a certain age, at 65, you know, you feel like, or 70 or whatever it is, you, you'd almost think that, that, you know, you could kind of get a pass and just kind of slide on in. But even now, his parents, and some of you here as well that may be singing a rage, you're battling things you never battled before. I mean, and his parents, they're one's in a, in, a, in a rehab facility, the other one is home without the other one, and uh, both are, are sick and been battling sicknesses. And, and, and you would think, but again, until you have passed over until the other side, we're all going to have struggles. It may not be the same struggle, but we're all going to have struggles. We're going to all have to deal with things. And sometimes, even in latter life, latter years of our life, it's things we never had to deal with before. But God, He is still faithful. He's still faithful. And He's still good. So today, if you're here and you're kind of, you know, everything's okay and you're comfortable and, you know, you're not battling anything and, woo, you're breathing a sigh of relief, well, listen, more than likely, not to be negative, but more than likely you're going to battle something this week. And maybe it's something you never had to battle before. So don't let your guard down. And for sure, don't drift away from God. Don't become at ease in Zion. We cannot afford at any age to neglect our salvation and let down. Which means we can't become complacent or comfortable or unconcerned or indifferent I challenge you today to stay in the race and not forsake the race you walk with God and and, and uh, hey those things you sold out to a long time ago those things you decided a long time ago that that was not God like and that was not for you to be involved in listen 
Don't go back on that. You stay true. You stay true to the convictions that God has placed into your heart. You stay true to the Word of God. You stay true to God and His ways. And if you will, there is a crown of life that awaits you on the other side when that time comes. Book of James 1 and 8. It reminds us that a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. A double-minded man says, I want to be safe and sound in my own home, but I also want to travel the world. A double-minded man says, I want to buy everything I see, but I also want to save all my money for a rainy day. The double-minded man says, I want to be slim and fit. Yet, also I want to eat everything I see. The double-minded man says, I want to be educated, but school is just not for me. I want to be popular. I want to be well-known, but I do not want to interact with people. I just don't like people. The double-minded man says, I want to drive slow in the fast lane. But I want to fuss at those driving fast in the slow lane. The double-minded man says, I want to profess that I'm a Christian and that I'm going to heaven, but I want to live like I'm going to hell. I'm talking about a double-minded man. The Bible says that no man, no woman, no boy, no girl can serve two masters. You've got to choose one or the other. You, you can't straddle a fence forever. Because eventually, your leg is going to get weak. And this fence is barbed wire. Just saying, think about that. Maybe not. The old Indian said, which dog is going to win the fight? The old Indian chief said, the dog that's going to win the fight will be the one that in the end you have fed the most. You have fed the most. Listen, what are you feeding your soul today? What have you been feeding your, your spiritual self? We best keep the main thing the main thing. For you see, above all else, we must be saved. Above all else. And to be saved in the end, we cannot be double-minded. We cannot neglect our salvation. We cannot neglect what we have been taught in the past. We cannot bypass the old past for a more smoother, wider road. We cannot forget the message that our parents and our grandparents believed and lived. We must not abandon truth. And we must not abandon the ways of God. Things that distract, things that hinder, things that blemishes your testimony, maybe even things that may not seem to be sinful. But maybe they're wrong for you because they are weights. They, bind, they bend your rails and those weights destroy your vision and they also consume your time, your precious time. And for any one of us, if we're not cautious, even though we've talked in tongues and we've shouted the victory from the hills and we've heard, God, we've heard the voice of God and we have been used even in the gifts of the Spirit, still we, none of us, are whole yet and, and sadly, you could still be lost. I, I say that not in, in the ha ha ha, but I say that with tears saying you could still be lost. And whatever you're going to be lost for, whatever you think it's worth, it's not worth ever being lost over. It's not. It's not. The Apostle Paul, a man that I would consider a godly man, a man that knew his way around, to say the least, religious circles, and he was highly respected to this day. We know he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, and so we, as a church, we highly respect him. But he wrote in 1 Corinthians 9.27, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. Lest that by any means what I have preached when I have preached, 
what I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Amen. And what a sad commentary that would be to almost get to the finish line and then lose your way. Even if your skirt is to your ankles and your hair drags the ground and you carry a large print King James Bible and you act like you and Jesus have your own thing going on, it's special, very special. And I'm sure that it is. Still, still, if, you're, if your attitude stinks and your motives are not pure and you're a toxic person and you're full of hate and revenge and bitterness and you're prejudiced, and you believe everyone's going to hell except you and your family. And you have an uncontrollable temper and, and you're not trustworthy and you're not a person of integrity and, and you don't keep your word and you cannot be counted on because you're wishy-washy and you have the attitude of, you know, no one's going to tell me what to do. Then it's time, my friend, for your own salvation, for, for the sake of your own soul. It's time to humble your spirit and pray back through to the salvation in which you first believed and experienced. No matter who you are, you've got to stay the course. You've got to stay the course and stay the battle and, and use discernment in the times in which we live. And, and we, we can't be deceived and we can't deceive ourselves into thinking that you will that you'll be okay, that I'll be okay just because I've been in the church for 40 years. That's not a guarantee. How can you have hope of escape? Escaping what is in store for the person who refuses to repent and make those necessary changes? If you yourself also neglect the maintenance of your salvation and take it for granted, and if you refuse to be instructed and, and heed the warnings along the way, how can you expect to escape? If you neglect holiness and righteousness unto the Lord, how can you expect to escape? If you neglect your personal walk with God, how can you expect to escape judgment? If you abandon the ways of God, then how in the world can you expect to escape? If you neglect God and you neglect His church and His word and the calling of God that's upon your life. How can you expect to escape? If you're living sloppy for God and, and you're kind of sort of hit and miss when it comes to your walk with God, then how can you expect to escape and make it to heaven? Leonard Ravenhill, he wrote... Those who will be much for God must be much with God. Those who will be much for God must be much with God. Could it be some are more concerned about gas prices and the price of tea in China and the high cost of groceries and how many followers they have on social media or they're so concerned and focused on and put all their energy into completing, completing some project or, or learning some new hobby or buying new boots or tires or whether they got invited or not out to eat with friends. Could it be, or could it be that some are more worried about those things than about being concerned about are they ready to meet Jesus face to face? This is not an easy message to preach. I'd love to preach something a whole lot more. Woo, you know you know what I'm saying, right? But I have to sound the warning today. I have to sound the warning. Otherwise, woe is me. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. That right there is, is, is you see it says, even, if you, even if, you, if you say, Lord, Lord, and Jesus, I love you and all that, but if you don't do the will of the Father which is in heaven, then basically you ain't going. 
Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have, have we not cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, this is Jesus talking here. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work and they with you. It appears these things were done, you know, casting out the, the demons and doing all this, all these wonderful works. It appears to me anyway, from my observation, that these deeds were done more out of a sense of pride. Hey, look what I'm doing for God. Hey, look how spiritual I am. Woo, woo. Come on now. Look, I'm closer to God than you are because I'm being used in the gifts and I did all these things. And competition in the church is never okay. And trying to draw attention away from God and to yourself is never, ever, ever appropriate. Several years ago, my, my wife and I, we were in California driving up the coast. It was a rare time. It was a special time for us to get to do that. And we were near uh, Bodega Bay, near uh, Petaluma, California. And we pulled into the parking lot of what appeared to be a beautiful beach. It was gorgeous. The water was the right color. The sand was just perfect. There was rocks. It was just, it was just an amazing looking place. But then, as I got out of the car, I noticed all these signs. There were signs posted everywhere. And also, I noticed there was hardly anybody else there. As a matter of fact, it was just my wife and I and this other couple who were over there. We were the only ones on that beautiful beach. And these signs I noticed said, "Dangerous undertow. Stay away from the water." So you were not even supposed to go into the water. It was beautiful. Everything looked perfect. You know, it was so gorgeous. But yet these signs were there saying, don't go in the water. There's a dangerous undertow. And about that time when we got out of the car, another man pulled up and he got out of his pickup truck and he just kind of began walking toward the beach. And this other man and this other woman who had been there before we got there, they said, hey, hey, sir, hey. Hey, hey. And he got closer and closer to the water. And, and, and each time he took a step closer, this couple began to yell louder. Hey, sir. Hey, 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 hey. Hey, hey, sir. Hey. And finally, they ran over to him and said, Sir, the water is dangerous. You, you, you shouldn't go in. But they had to get right in his face. Because apparently he didn't see the signs or he didn't care about the signs. Maybe he thought he was above the rules. Maybe he thought it was above, you know, any warning. But finally somebody approached him face to face and, face to face and says, Hey, there's danger here. We don't know who you are, but we care. Because we don't want to see you lose your life. Thankfully, the man that day got back into his truck and drove away. He heeded the warning, and to this day, I'm sure he's still living, I'm, I'm, I'm sure, because he heeded the warning. Yeah. So the steps, how do we respond? What steps do we take to respond to the warnings? The proper response because of the times. Because now is the time. Here we go. The proper response is to draw near, to draw nigh to God. James 4, 8. And if you will draw nigh to God, then God will draw nigh to you. That's the response. That's a proper response to the warning that is going out this morning. I've got to believe that Jesus is calling today. He's calling us not to leave, not to be like everybody else and, and fit into a particular mold. But He's calling us to again come out from among them and be a separate. Yes. Amen? Amen. Amen. Yes. The word anomaly, that is someone... Or something which deviates from what is standard, normal, or expected. He's calling you to be that person. A person that's willing to go to a level in God that they've never been before. And explore new territories in the kingdom of God. It's yours for the taking. Yeah, yeah. Second Chronicles chapter 7 verse 14 also gives... Father ways to respond to the warning on this Sunday morning. If my people which are called by my name 
shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Still, I'm aware that some folks, no one here but other places, they get set in their ways like concrete. They get set in their ways like concrete. And once that happens, it's hard to get those folks to budge. And their pride will eventually be their downfall because their pride keeps them from, from changing. Because if you, if you change, that must mean that the way I was doing it wasn't right. And so I've got pride. And so I don't want to admit, admit to anyone that I'm wrong or right that is if you're full of pride. And if a person is wrong to get right with God, the first step is to admit and repent. Yes, yes, yes. Repent means to change one's mind, to change one's direction, to turn around and go the other way. But some people don't want to admit wrong and repent because if they did, they would have to change their way. But again, nothing or no one is worth missing heaven over. One more note. Let me. Uh, one, one more note. If we look around and we look at our brother and sister, and we see their imperfections, we see their imperfections because you know what? We're a church of people. Right. We're a church. We're humble. We're, we're, we're supposed to be humble, but we're, we're human. Yes. And so we can pick at each other, and pick at each other, and pick at each other, and and identify all these faults, and we all have them. Because we're human. And so because the church has faults, I say the church, the people in the church has faults, then, then often we can feel like in our heart the best thing we can do is just pull away then from the church. But in essence, when we pull away from the church, we're pulling away from God. Because the church is there in our lives to give us what we need to make it to heaven. Right? So again, it's easy to look around, look at the preacher. He don't comb his hair right. He's too skinny. He's got other issues. He's from Arkansas. Goodness. There's a list of things I can get really, but I won't. We all have stuff, right? 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 But I'm thankful for the grace and the mercy of God, the fact that God forgives and He's helping us all. He is. He is. He is. He is. But, but it's so easy to look at everybody else and point out they're wrong and then not even realize we got some stuff too going on that we need to take care of as well. Don't pull away from the church. If everybody in the church is a hypocrite, at least you show up. At least there'll be one saint, right? <laughs> Come on, somebody. Come on, the church needs to be stronger and better. And, and you be here and you worship God and you live for God and you make it better and you pray. You be a light. Mama, mama, mama. Would you stand with me today? If you today have heard the warning and you feel guilt in your heart, maybe you have let some things slip. Maybe you have become distracted. Or maybe you've been focusing on things that really have harmed you and hampered you and hindered your walk with God. So if you feel like this message was for you today, know this. The altar is a place in which you can get some things fixed between you and God. And none of us can afford to walk out today without making sure everything is good between us and, and God. Keep in mind too that conviction pushes you. Conviction pushes you toward God after realizing that you were in the wrong. Condemnation pushes you away from God after sin or a failure. The first conviction is a gift. And the latter, condemnation is a lie. So on this Sunday morning, we need to embrace conviction and reject condemnation. John 3, 17, For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. There's mercy today in the house. There's grace in the house. 
there's opportunity to fix it with God or fix it with your brother or sister today. That spirit is here in the house. If you need a breakthrough today, you need a healing today, or you need to make some things right today, I ask, would you find yourself a place to pray today? Spend a little time with the Lord. Would you, would you find yourself an altar today? Because again, the best response really of all else is to find yourself alone with God and allow Him to work on you and you speak to Him. And if there's anything that needs to be fixed between you and God or anybody else, today's the day. Don't, don't go another day. Don't wait another minute. Today's the day. Today's the day. It's not time to let down. Instead, it's time to serve the Lord with gladness. And if you will, you will forever be happy that you did. Could we find us a place to pray today, church? Let's find us a place to pray. Let's find us an altar. And if the altar has been broken down in your life, fix your altar today. Fix your altar. Not because I'm great, not because I'm strong.